Today we have um, two guest speakers, uh, good friends and who do wonderful work here at the university, uh, Dan Starr and Stacy Harmer. Dan's going to talk to you about what well, glow in the dark world tell us about human development. Okay, so he's going to be talking about those sea elegance that we've been so fondly referring to, the ones that when you sit outside on the grass you probably smush several thousand of. Uh, but he studies them and knows a ton about them. And believe it or not, there's worm atlases out there. There's all kinds of things out there in the world uh, about these, and I'm sure he'll share some of these with you. So without any more introduction, here's Professor Dean Starr. Thanks. So yeah, so a couple things, main points that I want to get by today, and, and you probably have been you know, talked about these things throughout, is that that basic science, that just doing science for science's sake is a really important thing. So I'm talking to you guys today as, as taxpayers even, okay? So like the stimulus bills that the House and the Senate are working on right now, there's $3 billion in both of those bills for the National Institutes of Health to study basic science that will have some relationship to human, human health. The House bill had $800 million for the National Science Foundation, which was removed from the current Senate bill. But, you know, when these things go back to committees, these things could be added back in. But... But a lot of your taxpayer dollars are going to fund basic research, and hopefully today I'll convince you that that's a wise investment of taxpayer dollars. Um, and so, so I want you to know that basic science is really important. And then I'm going to take some tangents to talk about the green fluorescent protein. How many, have you guys talked about green fluorescent protein some in this class? And, and, and have you guys talked about the Nobel Prize? Anything a little bit? So, so I'll tell you. I heard one of the Nobel laureates give a give a talk last December that was more historical, so I give you some some of the history behind it, and and again it comes back to really that basic science is fundamental that that, that this this researcher um, was really just studying jellyfish because he was interested in why they glow and and it came to these findings that have revolutionized cell biology and medical medical biology because of that. So so we'll talk about these words, the elegance. And, and what they what we use them for, and so my lab is really interested in how the nucleus knows where to be in the cell. And you might sort of think this isn't that important of a problem, but but because most of the times you just sort of draw a cell and you draw a nucleus in the middle, and that's where the DNA is. Um, but it's actually quite important. So it's for a newly fertilized embryo, the male and the female pronuclei they have to migrate towards one another. And this has to be directed because they can't just sort of float around in here hoping that they're going to find each other. They have to actively migrate towards one, each other. And a muscle cell, so a skeletal muscle cell, forms when hundreds of cells fuse together to form a long tube that goes the whole length of your, of your muscle. And then that whole tube can contract at the same time so your muscle can move. And so there are nuclei throughout this tube, and they have to be spaced apart, and then a bunch of them cluster underneath where the neuron talks to the, to the muscle. So you only want one neuron to talk to this whole muscle, and you want the whole muscle to contract at the same time for your muscle to work. And so where the nuclei are will play an effect in that. If the nuclei are misplaced, it leads to diseases, neuromuscular diseases like muscular dystrophy and a lot of others. Then just in, in any cells that are polarized, for instance, the cells lying in your gut, the intestinal cells that bring food in through these microvilli and um, secreted into the bloodstream down here, they're polarized, the nuclei are polarized, there has to be a mechanism to get the nucleus here, and just as importantly, there has to be a mechanism to keep the nucleus here so it doesn't float away. Okay, so that's what we're going to get at at the end of the lecture. Um, but first, I, wanted to, I really want to spend probably the bulk of the lecture talking about Cenorhabditis elegans. So Cenorhabditis elegans, which I'll call C. elegans for short, is about a millimeter long. This is a... a um, a, uh, a, a scanning e uh, uh, scanning EM. So this is what it looks like um, an electro -mi microscope, electron microscope, and they're about a millimeter long. They live in the soil. They're free living in the soil. They eat bacteria in the soil. It turns out they're probably not everywhere. You're not probably not seeing them when you're on the ground. Most, if you want to find some sea elegans, your best bet is to go find a snail. And what happens is these silicons sort of hitchhike along with the snail. They sort of wait for the snail to die or to find something that's decomposing where there's a source of bacteria, and then they start eating that bacteria. So if you really want to find one of these in the wild, go find a snail in your bushes. All right, here's a blow-up. It is cool. I mean, there's their mouth. They're pretty simple. They got a mouth. These are just little noses, basically. They're little neurons sticking out into the, into the um, atmosphere where they can set smells. So these things can, can smell things. They can move towards smells they like and away from smells they don't like. Um, and here's what it looks like when you look at it underneath the light microscope. And you can see 
its skin is translucent, which, it, which makes it so good to do developmental biology because you can see the things in it um, as it's going along. And so I'll just point out a few things. Whoops. Okay, so for instance, I mean, uh, uh, so a worm is mostly gonad and gut. Okay, so here's its mouth up here, and this is its gonad. It's this long thing that comes all the way around here. And then, so these are, um, um, these are hermaphrodites, so they produce about 50 sperm, and then they switch over to producing oocytes, so they're self-fertile. So here are oocytes being pinched off, and you can see a whole, a whole egg, basically, with its nucleus. And then it goes through this fermentifica here, it gets fertilized, and these are embryos. So here's an embryo, a two-cell embryo, and then the embryos get laid out through the vulva, and then they can, they can um, grow up to be the worms. And back here, you can see the gut. Um, so here's the lumen of the gut, and you can see the gut there. And so it's a pretty simple worm. There's exactly 959 cells in an adult worm, and, and about 103 of them or something are neurons. So, it's, so it was really developed as a simple neuro, uh, neurobiologist or who, who first developed this system. Okay, so why do we work with this worm? They're easy to work with. They're easy to grow in the lab. You guys actually see them in a, in a lab? Have you actually seen them? But they, we grow them on little, just little agar plates. They eat bacteria, which we can grow in the lab real easily. Um, and we can grow, you know, thousands of these things in our, in our lab for, for very low costs. Um, it's a well-established genetic system. People have been working on this worm now for close to 40 years. And there's probably, at the last international C. elegans uh, conference in UCLA, there were probably about 1,700 scientists at it. So there's you know, roughly 2,000 people across the world who devote their lives to studying this little, uh, this little critter. So we've established lots of tools. They're easy to look at, um, easy to study development in. Um, I like to argue that worms are little humans. They're a lot easier to work with than humans. And an amazingly number of processes that occur in the worm are exactly conserved to the humans, including how nuclei are positioned, but a lot of other things too. Okay? And I'll show you examples of this as we go along. And then some great techniques, classic techniques, have been um, uh, really pioneered by um, C. elegans biologists, including RNAi, uh, in which you guys may not have heard of. Have anybody heard of RNAi? RNAi is, is a tool that we can use to directly knock down any gene of our choosing. And this tool has been developed really over the last 10 years, and this has the potential to revolutionize um, medicine. I won't talk about it today, but hopefully, it, um, if, especially certainly if you guys are bio, bio sci majors, you'll hear about this in your classes. And then green fluorescent protein, which we'll talk about a lot today. And to recognize the c contributions that C. elegans biologists have made to uh, medicine and biology, these three really the, these three really set up C. elegans as a model system. Uh, Sidney Brenner was really the, the person who really started it all. And um, Bob Horowitz um, worked out the whole cell death pathway. So sometimes cells have to commit suicide and kill themselves. Uh, an important example is if a cell in your body picks up a mutation that's sort of moving it towards being cancer, it can, usually will commit suicide. Okay? When it stops committing suicide, that's a problem when you're going to progress towards cancer. So apoptosis or programmed cell death is very important. If you lose the ability to do that, you're well on your way towards getting cancer. And he really molecularly identified the whole pathway for programmed cell death in worms, and amazingly, it's exactly conserved. It's the same molecules in the same order in humans how cells um, commit suicide or programmed cell death. And then John Sulston did a lot with the, the development of the worm and really um, characterizing how exactly the worm develops. And so they won the Nobel Prize in 2002 for Physiology and Medicine, these two guys, Andrew Fire, Andy Fire, and Craig Mello, both won the Nobel Prize in 2006 in physiology and medicine, and this was for really their contributions to RNAi, which I'm not going to talk about today. But you, you'll, you will, uh, it, it's been recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee, so this has the potential to revolutionize 
medicine, it's already revolutionized the way we do cell biology, even in mammalian cells, tissue culture cells <coughs> in the lab. So thousands of labs across the world now are using this technique. And then most recently, this C. elegans biologist, Marty Chalfi, uh, along with two other biologists, this um, oh Omahara Shimuhara, who, uh, a Japanese scientist who studies jellyfish, and Roger Shin um, in Southern California, really a classic biochemist. These guys won the Nobel Prize just this last year in chemistry, and that was for their discovery and their um, development for tools using the green fluorescent protein. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. And if, if any questions along the way, just interrupt me. Okay. Yeah. What do you mean by? I don't know. I learned about prokaryotes are really basic. Eukaryotes are. So, so RAI, um, RAI can be used basically probably anywhere. Okay, so RAI is probably a universal uh, thing that that cells have developed to really control when they turn on and off genes, and we can now take hijack those tools to turn off genes when we want to, and basically any system that we want to from mammals to probably bacteria, though I'm not sure it's been done in bacteria because there's easier ways to disrupt genes in bacteria. Um, and GFP is, is a green fluorescent protein, is a, is a protein that actually comes from a jellyfish, and we can express that protein in bacteria, you know, worms and flies, or I'll show you pictures where we express it in cats and pigs and, and, and bunny rabbits. So, so these things are wide-ranging um, I think what the Nobel Prize, especially in physiology and medicine, what they really care about is, is how does that relate to human health? And ultimately everything, you know, that's why we're being funded by the government to do these research is to, is to because hopefully it'll have some uh, positive implication on human health. So did that, did that answer your question? All right, so, so these worms are easy to work with. Their life cycle is about three days from when an egg is laid. They go through embryogenesis in about 15 hours. Then they go through these three, these three larval stages, and then they become an adult. So this whole thing takes about three days. They have this cool little side path called a dower, and that's if, if this L1 larvae you senses there's no more food around, it sort of goes into this, you sort of think of it as hibernation, but what it, what it becomes is it becomes, it becomes resistant to desiccation, so it doesn't need much water, and it doesn't need much food, and they're actually faster, and these guys will go off into the soil on their own looking for new bacteria. And then when they find a new source of food, they continue their development and start laying eggs to colonize that new source of bacteria and that new source of food. So these things are really easy to look at in the lab. I'm going to show you the whole 15 hours of this embryogenesis in about oh, 30 seconds or a minute. So um, here's an here's a embryo that's just been fertilized. Here's the male pronucleus. The sperm left this behind. Here's the female pronucleus. These are going to migrate towards one another. They're going to start undergoing mitosis. Within 15 hours, there's going to be a whole worm inside this eggshell that's going to hatch out. Right? So we can watch the whole 15 hours. Okay, <coughs> Two cells, four cells, eight cells. 1632. It'll get up to about 600 cells. <coughs> Once it gets to about 600 cells, it begins to squeeze itself from a ball into a tube shaped like a worm. So it's going to start happening about now. And you can see now we're at seven hours, and it's already twitching. Its muscles are already working seven hours into it. And um, so it's already crawling around in circles inside its, its eggshell now. All right, and it's finishing uh, development, and then it hatches. Okay, it doesn't actually show the hatching here, but so by now it's folded up about three and a half times in in there. All right, so we can watch that whole thing, and we can look for mutants that have divisions in the wrong place at the wrong time, or nuclei in the wrong place at the wrong time, or or this cell is supposed to become gut, but now all of a sudden it's becoming skin. So we can look at all those different mutants to really understand how development is occurring. Right? And what's cool about C. elegans is it has this invariant lineage of cell development. Okay? So, so there's exactly 959 cells in an adult C. elegans. This is very different than us. We have trillions of cells, but each one of us has a different number of cells. And, um, and the early embryo 
So the early embryo divides into these two cells, and these two cells already have names because they're different, right? So for instance, this cell divides into these two cells, this cell, the EMS cell, divides into the E cell and the MS cell. These names don't matter, but, but here at the, at the two, four, eight cell stage, there's one cell called the E cell, okay? So one out of eight cells in the embryo will form the intestine. This cell will only form intestine, and no other cells will contribute to the intestine. So if you destroy this cell and you leave the other seven along to go along, they'll make an animal without an intestine. Okay, it's not going to do so well. Okay. And similarly, by the 16 cell stage, this cell will make the germline, and it's the only cell that will make the germline. This is very different than the way that human developments, uh, as a human embryo develops, if it gets up to the 8, 16, 32 cell stage, you can take away a few of those cells, and the rest of the cells will just sort of make up for it. Okay? These are what we call pluripotent stem cells. Stem cells can make any type of tissue. That's why we want to go for embryonic stem cells. But here, there's not, these aren't really as, as pluripotent. By the time we get to an eight cell stage, this cell can only form intestine no matter what you do to it. So there's, it doesn't have the same pluripotency as, as human stem cells do. So if you want to study pluripotent stem cell development, maybe celiacs isn't the best place for you to do it. Okay. All right, so then we're going to talk about GFP now. So GFP, this green fluorescent protein, was found first in this jellyfish called Aquaria victoria. And these jellyfish live off the coast of California. Um, they're named Victoria because they were found off of uh, Victoria and Vancouver Island up in Puget Sound in, in, uh, in Washington, in the Northwest. And so here's a jellyfish, and you can sort of see they've got these, these tentacles. And along this this rim, this circle at the bottom of the jellyfish are these little organs that emit, um, can emit fluorescent light. Okay, they emit light. So um, to be a fluorescent light, you guys have talked about fluorescence. Fluorescent, a fluorescent molecule absorbs light at one wavelength of a high energy and emits light at a higher wavelength at a lower energy. Okay? And the rest of the... Um, and, and, and so, so that's uh, what fluorescence is. It, in, it absorbs a one light energy and emits at a lower light energy. So if you absorb, if, so the green fluorescent protein absorbs UV light and emits green light. Okay. So the UV light in a, in a jellyfish actually comes from another reaction, and um, we'll get to that in a little bit. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about history because. These three were recognized just this past year for the Nobel Prize for their work in GFP. And it really starts with, with uh, this man, Osamu Shimu, Shimomura, who really discovered the green fluorescent protein. Right? And his story really has to be pointed out. It starts in, in Nagasaki. Um, he was a survivor of the Nagasaki bomb. He was about 15 miles away from ground zero in Nagasaki in 1945 when, when we dropped the atomic bomb there. So... So had the bomb been 15 miles elsewhere, we might not have GFP today. But he survived that. In the 1960s, he went to this little... Um, uh, oh, if you guys want to know more about the history of GFP, on the Nobel, on the Nobel website, like if you, if you do a Google search of Nobel Prizes, each one of the three who got the Nobel Prize has a seminar, about a half-hour seminar on there. And they're designed for audiences like you. And they're fascinating to watch because they go into the history of things and how the science was done. And you just you don't get a lot of that in your education because a lot of your education is just textbooks. Here's green fluorescent protein. It absorbs UV light and emits, it, emits green light. But not many students really get to hear about the history of how these, these things were discovered. Right, so he worked at this marine biological station, Friday Harbor, on this little island, beautiful little island in Puget Sound, and, um, and he was really studying this, this blue release, okay? And you don't really need to know this, but, but the, the, the blue light was released when calcium wave comes through, and then the blue light excited the green fluorescent protein, which emitted the green light, okay? So there's actually two steps. And so it can do it all by itself with calcium to green light. Right? But, but what I want to point out here is he wanted to purify this reaction. He wanted to purify this molecule. Okay? To purify this molecule, he needed a milligram. Okay, a milligram, that's a thousandth of a gram. Not very much, right? He needed to collect 150 milligrams of this stuff. Okay? So now we're talking a tenth of a gram. Still not very much. But to get a tenth of a gram of this, he needed to process 50,000 jellyfish. Okay, so he had to collect 50,000 jellyfish, two and a half tons, in one summer. 
Okay? So you had to collect 2,000 to 3,000 jellyfish per day. Okay, so how do you collect 2,000 to 3,000 jellyfish per day? This is my favorite picture of this whole talk. You get your kids, your wife, your friends, you all get nets, and you go out to the docks in Friday Harbor and you get a whole bunch of buckets, and you start, oh, I don't have the next picture. Oh. You basically just stick these nets into the water off the docks and you scoop up the jellyfish as they float by. Okay, so this is amazing. And so they could collect two, two and a half tons in one summer. They would fill up these buckets, they would take them back, and then they had a bunch of grad students back in the building back there that processed these jellyfish. Okay? And, and one of the things that I got from the Nobel lectures was, was uh, so you had to collect 2.5 tons of jellyfish. These, these jellyfish, all the different species of jellyfish in Puget Sounds, their populations have collapsed a thousandfold since this experiment was done. It had nothing to do with them collecting lots of jellyfish. It had to do with pollutants coming out of Seattle and the large met metropo metropolitan areas in Vancouver going into the Puget Sound. Okay? This would not be possible today to do. Okay? So, so this is another sort of a pitch for biodiversity. Okay? If, if, these, if these jellyfish had collapsed in the 60s instead of the 80s, we wouldn't have GFP today because nobody would have been able to collect enough of these things to, to find the green fluorescent protein. Okay? So just a little side bit there. All right, so a little bit of the timeline. So in 1979, he, he collected enough of this stuff that he was able to purify it, and he came up with a structure of the chromophore. The chromophore is the interior of the protein, the, 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 the atoms that are, that are, are fluorescing, absorbing the light and emitting the new wavelength. Okay? And um, then about 1990, this, this person, Doug Prasher, who was a, an assistant, untenured professor, um, I, he worked on cloning the gene for green fluorescent protein. Right? And, and in about 1992, he was able to clone, he published the cloning of the gene for green fluorescent protein. Okay? This was in an obscure journal called Gene that not a lot of people paid attention to. Marty Chalfie, this is, the, this is the person who won the Nobel Prize who works with C. elegans. Okay? So he heard, he told this story, I heard him talking at a, a meeting last month, in, last December actually. He was telling the story about how he heard about this. He heard about GFP just in a seminar that he happened to go to one day. So whenever you can go to a seminar, go to a seminar. Okay? So he heard about GFP in the seminar and he goes, wow, that would be great if we could take this GFP, this green fluorescent protein, and put it into the worm and watch the worm turn green. Right? We could follow things. Right? So he, he um, made all these notes, and he has these pictures of these notes from his seminar that day, and he tried to call Doug Prasher, and he, he contacted Doug Prasher, who was working on cloning the gene, and, and Marty Chalfie said, well, this guy's cloning the gene. I'll just wait until he clones it, and then we'll collaborate and putting it into the, into the cell units. So Doug Prasher clones it in about 1990, and then he called up Marty Chalfie to say that he cloned the gene. Well, my, this was before emails, right? So you guys might not remember that time, before emails, before cell phones. So he called Marty Chalfie's office in Columbia, New York City, but Marty Chalfie was on sabbatical in Utah, so he didn't get the message. So he didn't get the message that Doug Prasher had cloned the gene. For three years, he didn't get this message. Three years later, he started thinking, well, I wonder if that bum Doug Prasher ever cloned the gene, and he did a, did a PubMed search. Okay, this was like the first year PubMed was around. This was like one of his very first pub. He goes, we got this new tool, PubMed, which you guys are going to use all the time. He goes, so they're using the web to search the literature. And he found that the gene had just been published in 1992. So that afternoon, he called Doug Prasher. They were mad at each other because they were supposed to collaborate, but they had to talk to each other, but then they, they worked all that out. And then they continued to collaborate. And then, um, so then from 92, it took about a year to, to get these GFP. First, they got them into bacteria and they got bacteria to fluoresce green, and then they got worms to fluoresce green by expressing this green fluorescent protein. This landed on the cover of Science, and within months he had 1,500 requests from other scientists, including me as a graduate student, for the gene to express in our systems, right? So he, he just got overwhelmed with, with requests for this. And, it's, it's, and, and to the point today where Oh, okay, so then in the late 90s, the third person who won the Nobel Prize, Roger said, he refined GFP, he isolated, he, he figured the structure of it, he isolated mutants in it that had different colors, that were more stable, more useful. He really made GFP as the useful tool that it is today. <coughs> and, and currently, 
If you do a PubMed search, there's about 30,000 publications now that use green fluorescent protein, including 65% of the articles in major cell biology journals today use green fluorescent proteins. So that's how widespread this tool has become. This, is, this has become something that we use every day in the lab. And just one side note, this poor guy, Doug Prasher, who didn't win the Nobel Prize, right, he, he cloned the gene for GFP. He could not get funding for this, right? The NIH would not fund him. He was denied tenure after publishing this gene. It was, it was before this happened. He was denied tenure. Today, he's driving an airport shuttle van in Florida. So, or at least last October, he was driving an airport shuttle van in Florida when, when the interviewers got to, to contact him. So, so science can be cruel, too. <laughs> yeah. So he was practically there. He was one small step away from being the Nobel laureate instead of Murray Chalfi. He didn't make that small step. Instead, he's an untenured person driving an airport van in Florida. So, interesting stories here. <laughs> so what can you do with GFP now? This was, I thought, one of the cooler things I saw with GFP. This is called the Brainbow. And, and what they've done is they've made a way so a mouse randomly activates a different green fluorescent protein or a red or a yellow or a purple fluorescent protein in each different neuron. So there's, I think, 17 different colors a neuron can be. And you can see they're all mixed together. But you can then follow, like, this nerve's axon way up along. And you can start to do pathfinding. And, and this is just beautiful use of, of um, GFP to sort of study cells inside of a brain. Oh, the genetics is, I, I don't want to go into the genetics here. They, they basically put in four or five different things and it would randomly shuffle them around and use different ones so then it would come up with a different color. All right, and you can, and people have done all sorts of bizarre things with this. So here are cats expressing, I don't know if we can turn the lights, can you guys see that? You see this cat expressing this red fluorescent protein? There. Right, so see, we can we can do funny things like put them in cats. We can there's a, a rabbit that's a green fluorescent protein. This was a famous rabbit made by a French artist. So this is art. This has nothing to do with science. This was purely made for art. Uh, here's a transgenic pig with a sibling that's not transgenic. This one is expressing a yellow fluorescent protein in its skin. So you can see the differences. But I mean, see, so you, you can do a lot of bizarre things with these green fluorescent proteins. Right. We sign up for that. You want, you want to sign up to become, to get to be green? <laughs> so yeah, there's all sorts of forms, and I'll have to do these things on humans, I'm sure. <laughs> but, um, okay, so back to the worm. And, um, and here's this early development again, and this is just the first two cell cycles of the worm. Okay, and we can watch it in traditional light microscope. We can see these nuclei meet, they center, then they divide along this way, they always divide along that way. And then there's two cells, and um, and one will start to divide here. This one's going to oh, this one's going to divide up and down. Then this one divides sideways. Okay, so you can watch this this development, and you can watch this now. This was the old way of looking at it, and now this is the same movie. You can now watch it with using green fluorescent protein. So here we've hooked up the gene for the green fluorescent protein to a histone. A histone is a protein that binds to DNA in the nucleus. Okay, so now we can see fluorescent nuclei. And we can watch this whole system live. Uh, we can now see the DNA. And you can see the stages. You can see metaphase, anaphase. You can see a lot more here than you could over here. Right? The decondensation. And then you can see the metaphase again here. You can see the chromosomes condensing. The metaphase aligning there. Anaphase. Here's metaphase. You can see a lot more with the green fluorescent protein than you can in the, in the light microscope. And here's another example. So tubulin, tubulin is a, a protein used to GFP here. These are the strings that pull the chromosomes apart that form the spindle. Okay? So here you can see the nuclear envelope breaks down, the spindle forms, and they pull the chromosomes apart. All right? So you could put now you could put a red fluorescent protein to be the, the DNA and a green fluorescent protein to be the spindle, and you can watch them both at the same time in different colors. All right? So that, that we can actually do in the lab. I don't have that movie here, but, but that, that's doable. Oops. Okay. All right. So, so sort of getting back to what I do in the lab, we work with the nuclear envelope. Okay? So the nucleus is where all the DNA is. You guys certainly all know that. The nuclear envelope 
is what separates the nucleus from the rest of the cell. Okay? And I just want to point out that there's two membranes here okay, that, that separate the nucleus from the nuclear envelope. And you can watch these membranes in real time, or the proteins, these are laminated proteins that immediately underlie this, this membrane. And you can watch this in real time. All right, so here's lamin GFP. <coughs> and you can see the nuclear envelope over here. It, it here, it breaks down. So the, so the lamin sort of disappears for a little bit. Now mitosis is happening. The chromosomes are segregating, anaphase. And now in telophase, the nuclear envelope is reformed. And you can watch the, the, the GFP come back. Right? So, um, and you can watch the next cell cycle, too. So we can hook up a green fluorescent protein to any protein we want and see where it is inside the cell, what it's doing throughout development, what it's doing through the cell cycle, what cells it's expressed in. Just an incredibly valuable tool. All right, so what do I study? I study how nuclei know where to be in the cell. And one of the proteins we study is this gene called ANC1. And what happens is, is this is a side of a worm, and these are the skin cells of the worm. So the skin cells of a worm have, are sort of like our muscles in that a bunch of cells are fused together to form this one big cell. Okay, so there's one big cell on top, one on bottom, and one down the middle here. All right, and there's a whole bunch of nuclei in these single cells. Normally, these nuclei are very spaced apart. So here's a green fluorescent protein that goes to the nucleus. We can see these nuclei are very spaced apart. In a mutant, so a mutation in this gene for ANC1, the nuclei are no longer anchored in place. They're anchorage defective, hence the name ANC1. And we can see large clusters of nuclei that have, have flown, clustered together, and, and these guys are moving back and forth through these large sensational cells. So they're no longer anchored apart. They're grouped together. And you can see that here, green fluorescent protein, you can see these nuclei clustering together. All right? So that's the mutants we did, we, we found, and I, I figured out what this gene was. Oh, this gene also disrupts mitochondria. So mitochondria, you, you probably heard from your, your, your high school biology classes, are the powerhouses of the cell. Normally, in a cell, in a muscle cell, the mitochondria, which are now green, we've now made the mitochondria with a GFP, the mitochondria are strung out along the fibers of the muscles. In a mutation in ANC1, we get mitochondria sort of ball up, and they move back and forth through the cell. They're completely mispositioned. So both nuclei and mitochondria are not in the right place at the right time. And we can see this by GFP. This would be very difficult to see without, without GFP. Certainly can't do it with live. So <clears throat> what is this protein? This protein ANC1 turns out to be a, a gigantic protein, and one end binds to the nuclear envelope, and the other end binds to the actin cytoskeleton. So the actin cytoskeleton is sort of like the structure of the cell. Okay? So this is a rope that connects the nucleus to the structures of the cell. And now if you have this rope going off in all directions from the nucleus, the nucleus is going to be held in place so it doesn't get pulled away. Right? And then the other thing that our work has discovered is this, this bridge across the nuclear envelope. So the nuclear envelope, remember, has two membranes. And so to connect the inside of the nuclear envelope to the structural elements of the cell, you have to bridge these two membranes, and these proteins do that. Okay? And, and this protein looks a lot like dystrophin. So dystrophin is one of the main genes that can be disrupted in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which is one of the most common forms of common genetic diseases. Um, so muscular dystrophy... If you have a mutation in this protein, you get a defect in muscular dystrophy. And these proteins look a lot like um, the ANC1 and the human homologue of ANC1, which is called SIGN. Okay? And, and there's a lot of similarities. I don't want to get into them too much here because I'm running out of time. So, so that's ANC1 in worms. It's used to, to, to anchor nuclei in place and to anchor mitochondria in place. But what does this have to do with human health? All right? So the mammalian... So, after I cloned this gene in C. elegans, I looked at the human genome project, which had just been completed, and I could see there were two genes that looked an awful lot like the C. elegans ANC1. So somehow, somewhere in the evolution between a worm and humans, this gene is duplicated, and now there's two copies of it in, in the human genome. Right? And the question is, do they anchor nuclei? And the most obvious place to look at are these muscles, these long fibers, 
uh, that we have. And again, this would be hard to do in humans, so I actually did this in mice. And, and um, okay. other people have done this in mice now. Right, so, so I made a, a mouse, but then this, this mouse is a little more sophisticated. This, is, uh, um, this isn't the one I made, but this is a mouse where we've knocked out both copies of this gene for sine 1. Okay, sine 1 is one of the home logs of ink 1. So normally in a mouse, this is a muscle, a muscle cell going in and out like this, and these green things are nuclei that are normally evenly spaced apart in the muscle cell. <clears throat> in a sine 1 mutant, we have these big clusters of nuclei, and these muscles still work in the mouse, but they're not quite as efficient. And if you knock out both sine 1 and sine 2, both copies of the ink one, um, then the mice die. The mice die at birth because their lungs can't inflate, because their diaphragm's not working, because it's a muscle, and so it can't, can't breathe. So its muscles are defective. And, and we think probably that these mice that lose just the sine 1 gene are probably in some way sick. They probably have something that looks like a, a muscular dystrophy or something, but muscular dystrophy is much harder to study in a mouse than it is in a human. A mouse lives a much shorter time anyway, so it's just more difficult to see. And these genes, which are called sin 1, they're also called Nesprin because they've been isolated by a couple different labs. It's Nesprin 1 is the same gene. So here, Nesprin 1 and Nesprin 2 are involved in emeryodicus muscular dystrophy. Okay, so these are just three papers that were published in 2007 that, that are just pointing out the importance of these genes in human health. Okay, so here, these genes are involved in emeryodicus muscular dystrophy, a, a relatively rare form of muscular dystrophy, but, but still a, a problem. Here is, um, um, this gene is involved in a disease called progeria. Progeria is a disease, it's very rare, but it's, a, it's an accelerated aging disease. It's, it's, it's really bizarre, where, where um, kids age about 10 times the rate as normal humans. So a 7-year-old kid will look like they're 70. They have wrinkled skin, their hair is gray, they're losing their hair, they've started to shrink from the height, of the stunted height that they ever even got, they start getting things like osteoporosis, and they have heart attacks because their, their hearts are getting old. So, so it's, a, it's a really bizarre accelerated aging. And, and actually, it, in kind of an amazing story how fast science can sometimes go, in the last 10 years, really, the genes involved in progeria have been discovered, and we could cure a lot of cases, well, not cure, but we can effectively treat or delay a lot of these cases of progeria now with a drug that was already on the market for, for a cancer. <clears throat> and then here, mutations in this gene sign 1 lead to a, a, um, a cerebellar ataxia. So a cerebellar ataxia is an inherited um, a neuronal defect where you have problems with balance and walking, and this can lead to more neurodegenerative problems later on in life. So, so the point is that this gene ink one which can link the actin cytoskeleton to the nucleus, has homologs in humans, sine 1 and sine 2, and these homologs are involved in diseases. These things would not have been found, or this function would not have been discovered in humans. It would have been incredibly tough. And it was the worm that we were able to des describe how this gene worked, and then we could go check that in mice it's working the same way. So it's really the contributions of the basic science in the worms that allowed us to start to understand how these genes work. And along the way, we've also characterized this bridge across the nuclear envelope, and this bridge is involved in a whole bunch of different cellular processes, including connections to other structures in the cell, um, and, and other filaments in the cell, and connections to chromosomes in um, in the, in the, inside the nucleus, and they're even involved in meiosis, where, where the mom and the dad chromosomes have to find each other, these proteins play a role in it. So they've really, it's really been surprising that this, this uh, bridge has been conserved to a whole bunch of different cellular functions, so it was really this basic science of studying how does the nucleus know where to be in the cell of a C. elegans of this worm, has had these broad implications in a whole bunch of different diseases, and cellular processes that, that wouldn't have been found without this science, basic science. And along the way, we used this green fluorescent protein as a tool, and um, they just sort of introduced that to you guys because it's a biophotonics class and because it's timely and cool. And um, and that's that's it. I can answer any questions. <coughs>
Well, a little fast, but you guys weren't asking me questions as long the way. <laughs> I have a question for you. Yeah. So you've got the nuclei clustering, and so the muscle doesn't function as well. It looks from the images like the nuclei are like smacked out against each other. But isn't there still a cellular membrane between the... Iron no, this is in a muscle cell. So, so, one, so cell has one muscle cell, basically, a one muscle fiber forms when about 400 cells fuse together to form a long tube. So that's how our muscles work. And then you have that whole tube... Instead of having four individuals, it's much easier to get that whole tube to contract all at the same time. So that's how our skeletal muscles form. When, so then, when you do damage to your muscle, you, you aren't remaking the whole cell. You're just injecting sort of more cells will fuse into that tube to, to, to reform that cell. So by fusing, they lose the cellular membrane? Right, right. They'll fuse, and then they'll add more nuclei into that, into that, into that cell. And that's why muscular dystrophy is a... a, a progressive de degenerative disease where a 10 year old kid could be totally fine by the time they reach 15 or 20 they've started to have all these problems because because their muscles have limited abilities to regenerate and that's why you're going after they're going after stem cells to treat some of these diseases because if you didn't run out of stem cells you would never get muscular dystrophy because you could keep repairing the, the, the two I mean the muscle cell is actually an incredible system when you think about it so that's one cell will go the whole length of your muscle so your whole muscle can contract at the same time, so that only one neuron has to talk to that whole cell at the same time, so the whole thing contracts. But that's one cell has 400 nuclei. Yeah, or some of them have thousand, a couple thousand nuclei. So, so um, I mean, when you when you eat a, a, a when you eat like a meat, like especially like a, a brisket or a corned beef or something, you get these long stringy things. Those are bundles of these tubes, and so these you know you see the fibers of especially the steak. So why is it that when this uh, sign one or whatever it is, depending on the organism, when it's not present that they that the nuclei bunch up instead of being stayed and distributed? Um, that's an excellent question. I don't think we really know the answer, but um, I think what happens as the muscle starts flexing, so a muscle is pretty tightly packed with actin, myosin, contractile fibers, and the nuclei are sort of like pushed off to the side. Okay, so these nuclei sort of look like little bumps on the side of a muscle because most of it are these fibers that are interacting. And so as these fibers interact and flex around, they're going to, they put a lot of pressures on the nuclei and the other stuff to start being, sort of being pushed around passively. And then when they start forming clumps together, that makes these bumps sort of easier to form. And so they're, e they're just more happy sticking together. Um, so I think you actively have to keep them held in place so they don't end up in clumps. So, so both of them act the same way. They both act normally to connect the nucleus to the actin. And if you get rid of ANC1 in worms or sign one in humans, the nuclei are no longer connected to the actin, and now the nuclei can float around in the cell. And this can have not just muscles, but this can affect other cells too. Um, I have a question about Doug uh, Asher. Right. Um, why exactly did he get left out? And if people now notice that he was left out, why aren't people doing anything about it? Like, it just seems well, like so there's, there's a lot of politics in the awarding of Nobel Prizes. So, so first of all, when Alfred Nobel set up this foundation to award Nobel Prizes, no prize can be split among more than three people. Okay? You can give a prize to a whole foundation, you know, Doctors Without Borders, you know, got it a few years ago, you know, um, Princess Diana's foundation got it after, year after she died. So the Nobel Committee can give it to a whole foundation, but they can only split it among three people. So the Nobel Committee has to decide which three people made the biggest contribution to the field, or sometimes one or two people. In this case, they decide the other three people made a bigger contribution. I would agree the other three people did make a bigger contribution, but with any Nobel Prize, there's always somebody who did something that, that you couldn't have done that discovery without the background. So, I mean, one of the most common things in science is to say that we stand up, as a scientist, I stand on the shoulders of thousands of other scientists because all the work that I do isn't possible without the thousands of other things that have happened in the past. So it's just, 
unfortunate. And he has gotten a lot of publicity in the last couple of years because of it. And I don't know. It would be interesting to see in the last three months if he's gotten a job. Yeah. That's going to be my question. Yeah. Why I, I actually have done a Google search of him today. If he's done this, he's done this why you know, you know, if, he's, if he's got a job. I mean, you know, he's been out of science now for 15 years, too. So, so you know, he's, he's way behind anyways. Why did he lose John in the first place? Like, if you don't get the whole prize, are you like... No, no, no. So, so, so there's this complicated process called tenure, which I'm living in right now. <laughs> so when they hired me as a professor at the University of California, I basically get six years to prove my worth, okay? So, so I have to prove my worth in the classroom teaching you guys, and I have to prove my worth in the research because we have two, two, major, um, uh, two major goals of, of this university is teaching and research. So I have to prove myself in the research way. It means I have to get funding from the government. I get my funding from the National Institutes of Health. I have to have graduate students who come in and get PhDs with me, and I have to publish my papers in top journals. Right? So that's all going fairly well. I'm going to come for tenure next year. I'm pretty optimistic it's going to go well. But for Doug Prasher, he just... His lab just never really got going. He didn't have that much. He had this one project, which turned out to be incredibly important. But at the time, that, that, I guess is the, goal, the moral of my story. At the time, nobody realized the importance of his project. Okay, so they probably made a mistake because he was doing something incredibly important, but but it wasn't fundable. So he wasn't able to get money, and and, and people didn't recognize its importance. Marty Chalfie recognized its importance. And maybe that's why he got the Nobel Prize, because he was the one person that recognized his importance. It had been sitting in the literature for two or three years before Murray Chelsea got to it. He was the only person that recognized his importance. And for all three, and also I should say, for all three of these guys that got the Nobel Prize, they got it for something that was a very small part of their scientific career. Okay? So the Nobel Prize is awarded on one finding. But, but all three of these, if you were to ask them, that's not their proudest most significant finding in their, their eyes. And Marty Chelfi was kind of just in the right place at the right time and could use the worms to express the GFP. But there were a lot of other people that could have done that too, but he was the only one that did it. But that wasn't, the goal of his lab wasn't to make a worm green. The goal of his lab was to understand how neurons respond to mechanical stimuli, and, and he just thought this as a possible tool. The Shimohara was really interested in how fluorescence happens his, his biggest contribution was really upstream of the green fluorescent protein and, and the, and the, the aquarin, the, 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 the little things. Those things were much more substantial. And Roger Hsien, he gave this amazing, amazing seminar in December of some of the things he's doing in his lab now that, that to me blow away what GFP is doing. Because he's made now, he's made fluorescent proteins all across the spectrum. And he just came up with an infrared fluorescent protein. And the reason you want to use infrared fluorescent protein is because infrared will penetrate the skin much further. So he's got an infrared fluorescent protein, and he's got to express in a rat liver, and you can see it through the skin of the rat. And he's doing these incredible things where he's targeting fluorescent proteins to cancer cells. So now, if you can, if you can inject a patient with a fluorescent protein that's taken up only by the cancer cells, now when the surgeon goes in to take out the tumor, so normally what happens is the surgeon goes in and takes out a tumor and then starts cutting around the tumor and gives these cells to a pathologist who's sitting in the next room who's looking at the cells and saying, okay, you got it all or you don't have it all. And that's a pretty inexact science because the pathologist misses a lot of things. But now he's developed this tool where, where the tumor becomes fluorescent, so now the surgeon cuts out his tumor and then shines a light on it and says, ooh, I missed a little piece right there, and they go back in and they cut out a little bit more. And so this has a chance of revolutionizing the, the cancer tumor surgeries, which can really lead to a better prognosis after you then go chemotherapy or radiation <coughs> therapy or whatever you're going to do afterwards. And in fact, they showed in this one mouse, this, these mice system that they were using in the talk, these mice had a 10% survival rate after the surgery for this huge, removing this huge tumor. And when they shined the red light on it to get, see the fluorescence, it, the, the survival rate went to 30%. So, so by targeting these fluorescent proteins, they've increased the prognosis of these mice threefold, which is pretty phenomenal. How does the infrared or fluorescent tag only like stick to cancer cells? Oh, so that's, okay, so, so cancer cells, one thing that you have to be to be a cancer cell is you have to metastasize. So you have to be able to secrete a protease which breaks open the networks around the cells so you can move through those into another part of the body. Okay, so... So he, he set up a thing where it responds to that protease, 
and it gets hit by a protease which cleaves off something, and that makes it fluorescent. So it's only fluorescent in the presence of that protease. So basically, it's a way of now saying where that protease is. So I tried to see if that was published yet. It hasn't been published yet, but, uh, but it, 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 well, parts of it have, but it, you know, it's a little bit complicated to get into at this level. Any other questions? Let's thank our speaker. Did you have a chance to tell them at all about how you got into this? No, I didn't tell you guys how I got into this. Just take a couple of minutes. Sure. So I was, um, you know, as an undergraduate like you, as a freshman, as an undergraduate, what what did I think as a freshman, as an undergrad? I knew I knew I wanted to be a scientist or a mathematician. That's all I sort of knew. I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer. My dad was a lawyer. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I didn't want to do that. (laughs) So, So that's how far I was. And so I just started taking biology and math classes. And I really thought I wanted to be a chemist or a physicist. And I just loved the biology classes. So I loved my biology classes more and more. So I became a biology major. And then I said, you know, you know, this is great. I can go to grad school. They'll pay me to do science. I can keep being a biologist. And so, so I went to uh, Cornell in upstate New York for graduate school where I studied genetics. And I studied, um, and I used the Drosophila fruit fly as a model system. And, and I worked there for about six or seven years. Um, studying, studying how these um, how chromosomes segregate in mitosis, really. And then after that, I went and did more research at the University of Colorado for five years in Boulder, where I really started this work. And so I did, did it for five years in Colorado, and I've been doing it for about six years here. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Well, thank you, Dan. Yeah. Thanks, Michael.